and were presented to the international governing body at our annual general meeting in Mayapur, which was in March of this year. So this is Prabhupada saying, from a grain of rice, you can understand the whole pot. So, and if I were to present all of the amazing things that energetic, creative, innovative devotees around the world are making, we could be here for a week, two weeks easily. It really is like, you know, when they churn the ocean of milk and all the wonderful things that, and amazing things, you know, the demons and the, and the demigods. So this is just a sampling. And I selected things that happen in different parts of the world and only I took four. So these are four showcases of the kind of innovative, creative, determined things that the devotees do. And we are all part of that. So it's something wonderful. And it, <laughs> Prabhupada said, spiritual movement in the material world, difficult proposal. But it is going on. Prabhupada, I was sitting in Prabhupada's room in Detroit, and I can't remember the years when we first got the Devasadan Mandir. And this Indian man kept needling Prabhupada, tell me about the pastimes of Krishna. Tell anybody who wants to hear some Ras Kata, which, you know, completely unqualified and over our head. And, and Prabhupada wouldn't do it. And he needled him a couple times and Prabhupada slammed his hand down on his desk. And he said, this Iskhan is an incarnation of Krishna. And he's come again to save the world. So, it, you know, it may sound bombastic if we say that amongst ourselves, but if you step back and look at it, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing mystical thing. So, without further ado, thank you, Sham. Even though I harassed you yesterday, you're still stepping into the target. Okay, go ahead. What's the next? So, this is... Of course, this is Govardhan Hill, the greatest of devotees. And we need, we need it in India, we need in, in America, we need on the East Coast, in the Midwest, and on the West Coast, we need retreat centers. We need places that we can hold big events and conferences because we're getting to that size. So this is the conference center in uh, at the base of Govardhan Hill, Burjan Prabhu inherited some money and then raised some money from some disciples. And Brajabihari Prabhu oversaw the construction. So this is the Govardhan Retreat Center. Next. So just for fun, this is a Davis view of Govardhan Hill because we don't put our feet on it, but you can, you can do it with a drone. Okay, next. So this is the campus, and the campus is, I don't want to blind anybody here. What is this? Okay. The, the campus is this whole thing. All of this. Not this building, but all of this. This is the conference center. These are all, there's a big kitchen and a conference hall, you'll see. These are all dormitories, classrooms. They've got nice little bungalows for it's unbelievable. Next. So this is the entrance of the main hall. It had not opened at this photo. This is just as they're finishing it up. Next. This is a side view. This is the first conference. It says, welcome. What does it say? The devotees of who knows where, somewhere. Okay, next. Yeah, that's the hall. Look at that. It's huge. And it's packed. Roger Bihari was saying the only thing we regret is that we didn't make it bigger. <laughs> Next. This is the dining hall taking prasadam. It's like first class. 
Next. Okay, now we're going to Kazakhstan. And just so you can find it on a map, here's Russia. You know, you've got an idea of where it is. Here's Afghanistan, here's India. So, next. Now, there's some history on Kazakhstan. Click it back. Thanks, Sean. The Bibi Govinda Maharaj went there. It's, it's a Muslim country, Christian country, Russian Orthodox. It's an interesting mix. Are you from Kazakhstan? Look at that. Hare Krishna. I better be careful what I say. <laughs> You're on our side, right? You know. So the, uh, the Bibi Govinda Maharaj, wonderful devotee, got the whole place going, and they built up a beautiful farm community. And the brother-in-law, I may not have the relation just right, brother-in-law, brother, something like that, of the prime minister, used to drive past on the way to his own farm, used to drive past ours and saw it get more and more beautiful. And he became envious. And he actually arranged, they stole our land. They came with bulldozers. Those of you who are around, I don't know how long ago that was. How long ago? Maybe he doesn't follow. So uh, they just bulldozed everything. And the devotees had to literally flee for their lives. And they started all over again. And another piece of property, built the whole thing. So you'll see. Just like you may or may not know this, but Prabhupada's, the original draft for Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is, he got on, because it was a paper shortage because of the war and so many things in India was just getting started, so paper shortage. And Prabhupada wrote by hand the entire Bhagavad Gita as it is on the back of letterhead from the Russian embassy, Soviet embassy. You can be, sh we're off the track, but why not? We've got a little time. The, um, when Prabhupada went to Russia, you had to go on the government tour. It was very, this is Soviet Union time. So you had to go Brezhnev and that whole, you had to, well, maybe it's even before Brezhnev, but you had to stay on the, uh, on the government path, on the, on the tour. So they took Prabhupada to Red Square, you know, to see the, whatever it is, the Kremlin and the whole thing. And that's where Lenin is buried. He's now 90% wax, but they've got the body of, you know, entombed there. And everybody lines up to go see him. If you're a good communist, like going to Brindavan or going to Mecca, everybody goes to see Lenin. So Prabhupada's driving in the government car on the government tour, sees this big, huge line. People queue up overnight, lined up to go see Lenin's body, Lenin's tomb. So Prabhupada asked, what are they lined up for? Sham said, to go see Lenin's body. Prabhupada said, do you know why they're all going? Sham said, no. Prabhupada said, to make sure he's dead. <laughs> so, you know, this is the, the era. And they took our land and smashed, you know. So next. Just so you appreciate, and they started all over again. So this is all devotees. This whole scene started from nothing. Next. Here's another angle. I think this is the temple room here. This, but this is all devotee houses. Devotee gardening. Okay, next. Just to give you a sample from nothing. Next. Okay, next. I mean, before this, anybody here know about Kazakhstan? Maybe a little something. It's an amazing thing. Okay, so this is Myanmar, which used to be Burma. Myanmar's right up here. It's between India and China. I think Thailand's on one side, you know. 54 uh, million is the population. It's a big place. And uh, it's a very strict Buddhist nation. It's very, and, and it's a heavy, heavy dictatorship. 
I mean, it's just like preaching in Saudi Arabia. It's, it's, they're that heavy. And the people are wonderful. I've been visiting there for 10 years. The communist, I mean, not communist, the military dictatorship is rapacious. They're vicious. You can't have a cell phone. To have a cell phone costs $3,000. More than four people gather together of not of the same family. You, know, you can have a birthday party, you can have a wedding, whatever. But if more than four people gather together, they can throw you all in jail. The, the largest natural teakwood forest in the world, the United Nations has declared it a World Heritage Site, which means it belongs to the world. You have to protect it. The military government sold to the Chinese, who, as we speak, are going through it, chewing up. I mean, there's black rhinos in there. Who knows what's in that place? And they're just leaving scorched red earth behind it, <laughs> gobbling everything up and spitting out the teakwood. So it, it, it's, a, it's a rough country. Um, but the people are wonderful, and it has a rich Buddhist tradition. So, but what to do next? Because all you can do, the, the, I mean, I don't want to spend too much time on but just to, it used to be part of India. And business people would sail up across the Bay of Bengal from India up the Iriwata River. You can sail all the way up to the end. You're, you're, you're in China. And it's like a one day overland uh, and then you're on the y Yangtze River and you can sail all the way down through China. It was a major trade route between China and India. And so Indian businessmen, they built temples. And for many, many years, all through the British Raj, they were, they were going on. When they finally got their freedom from the British, uh, the local Buddhists and Burmese people took over. And if you were non-Buddhist, if you were a Hindu non-Buddhist, you couldn't get top contracts from the government. You couldn't get business exchange licenses. They heavily suppressed the Indians. So most of them left, just went back to India over the course of a generation or two. So there are many, many temples that are being abandoned. Have been just you know, the first, first time I went there, and they're donating them to us. They donate to ISKCON. We have gotten about six or seven temples donated. If we'll take care of the deities, they'll give the temple to us. One of the temples I was in is just, it looks like Jayapur. It's, it's, it's Rajasthani style, like that Haveli, the, you know, anyway. And the kitchen is about half as big as this room. It's a marble floor with its own well, but it had been abandoned for about, I guess I'll tell the whole story. It's been abandoned for about, uh, I don't know what, 20 years. And we finally, they got it donated to us. We spent the night there. I was with Srivast uh, Pandit, who was in charge. We went down there to check it out. And all night, it was a, it was just a picture, you know, windows, roof caved in, all that kind of stuff. All night long, somebody was making noise next to me. I could barely sleep. There's no electricity, so I waited for the electricity to go back on. It was, you know, seven o'clock in the morning, sun came back. Went there was a cow, a, a mother cow and a baby calf had moved in. And they were sleeping next to me. They were making noise. You know, this, you know. So it's, we've actually had to tell them, this was, uh, this, this temple is, is right across the river from downtown Yangon, the, cap the business capital of the place. These are here some Burmese devotees. This whole building, the roof was caving in. It was a Sita Ram temple. So we kept the beautiful Sita Ram deities. There's a little deity of Buddha. Prabhupada said you could do that. He told the devotees in Hong Kong. There's a, and then they've completely renovated. Now. Where did they get the money? Just to confirm that we are in a mystical movement. 
and Krishna moves in his own ways. How the whole thing got started from one book will tell some other time. Literally, one book distributed to some Burmese doctors in, in uh, downtown New York City, thousands of miles away, uh, and it's a whole story. But just here's a sample of the history of the Burmese Yatra. There was a Hindu businessman, and he, his whole family was an array. He was drinking, the wife was going to leave him, the, the son was a dimwit playboy, and the daughter was running around with different boys. Whole family was in disarray. They met Srivas Pandit, who convinced them to become devotees. The husband straightened up his act, saved the marriage. The boy turned out to not be a dim whip, but just angry at his father. His father became a nice devotee. Son snapped right around, helped him with the business. The daughter married an initiated devotee completely. Everybody straightened out. The man was by the addition of Krishna consciousness and Srivas Pandit's good guidance. The man purchased an abandoned ruby mine. It had been mined out, you know, but it had some, with new equipment, this and that, you could get uh, industrial rubies. Burma is a very rich, uh, Myanmar is a very rich country in mineral, jade, gold, so many things. Rubies. So he said, the first ruby we get, when I open up the mine and it starts working, the first ruby I get that comes out, we're going to give to you. And they use them in those like, uh, you know, laser pointers and medical machinery and stuff like that. And he thought it'd be worth, you know, at the most, a couple thousand dollars. Still, in a country like this, that's a nice donation. You know, in, in, everywhere it's a nice donation. So, sure enough, they got the mine opening. The first ruby was like the size of a golf ball. The guy didn't want to give it, actually. He was like, you know, well, I, you know, I'll give you the next one, you know. And the wife put, pray, you know, come on, you promised Krishna, I don't want it. I don't want that. It's a death now. You give it to the devotees. You have to keep your promise. So uh, he did. And they sold it. They've invested it. And that money sits as a development fund. They've purchased the building in downtown Yangon. Because when a country, you could never buy it now. But I don't know. It was like $300,000. It's right downtown Yangon, which is the main city in it. Uh, and the ground floor is a restaurant. The next floor is a, is a yoga studio, you know, Krishna Lounge Center. The next floor is where they have all their offices. And the next floor is a temple. It's quiet. You can't really advertise it, but it's a nice temple. And, it, and, and then the money they have left, they don't spend the, the principal now. They spend, you know, whatever the annual income for fixing up these temples and because I've been I, it's a whole story I've been going for years I got to see this place with a cow living in it and the roof collapsed and you know bats flying in and out during Mangal Arti literally I went to use the bathroom in the room I was staying in your ee, ee, door almost fell a sink fell off and then I got up in the morning and there was a, a, a big black snake wrapped around the toilet, the commode. Whoa! You know? <laughs> Went and got the devotees. They said, no, 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 Maharaj, you like that snake. The snake eats all the rats. Yeah, so, okay, I guess I can adjust my mind to that. So, so uh, little by little, they're fixing up all these temples. And like I say, we've got about six or seven. This one is in a fantastic location. It's the old European quarter, just across the side of the river from the main downtown. It's unbelievable. It's about five and a half acres land donated. It's unbelievable. They got nice cottages. They got a garden. Every time you go, they've fixed it up. I mean, now you can't get in because the whole country is falling apart. Okay, next. This is the temple they're building for Lord Jagannath. I, well, what the heck, I'll say it. That book, 
I mean, you couldn't get a job. You couldn't get, I mean, people were fleeing Burma because it's such an oppressive place. Srivas Pandit was a college student. Well, I'll say it this way. There were some Burmese doctors visiting for a medical convention in New York City. They're seeing the sights. They were on the, what is it, Avenue of Americas, one of the big, busy pedestrian streets in New York City. They meet a devotee on Sankirtan. He gives them Bhagavad Gita. They say, no, 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 that's a Hindu book. Intelligent devotee opens up to the Das Avatar picture and says, no, 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 it's also, it's the perfection of Buddhism. They show him the picture of Buddha. So they say, okay, they buy the book. They get home to their hotel, they look at it. Well, you know, it's really, you know, it's not for us. It's not about Buddha and, and whatever. So they, but they had some Hindu doctor friends. So they say, they took it back to Burma. So it's gone from New York City to Burma. The Hindu doctor friend um, looks at it and he's a hardcore Advaitas, Sankaracharya, impersonalist. He says, ah, oh, this is personalism. This, you know, I'm not, puts it on his shelf. And if you know, often if you go into a doctor's office, they've always got those stacks of different studies and reports and, you know, you know. so he just doesn't want to step. His son wanted to learn English and so he could get out of Burma and get a job somewhere else, Thailand, somewhere, Singapore, you know. He sees this big, thick English book. Could have been about how to bake Japa, you know, whatever. He just, it was an English book. He bought himself a Burmese English, English Burmese book. And he figured, I'll just, tran I'll work on translating the book. I don't care what the subject matter is. And in this way, I can learn English. I know Burmese, I can, I'll sort my way through it. So he said, simply with the intent of learning English, he goes through the Bhagavad Gita. By the sixth chapter, he's a full-blown devotee. No other devotees, no other, just by getting Bhagavad Gita. So, so then he got in big fights with his impersonalist father. Because, you know, you, this is not what the, the Vedas actually say. And, you know, the first, last line of Vedanta Sutra is the first line of, 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 of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is the proper commentary on Vedanta. They got into the whole thing. The father was so puffed up, he said, if you, if you don't change, I'm throwing you out of the house. The son said, I'm never going to change. I'm leaving. And he moved out. I mean, the story goes on and on. The father is now an initiated devotee named Bhagawan Das. So it's a, it's a far out story. But the point is, where was he going to go? He moved into an abandoned Jagannath temple. Abandoned, same thing, collab, you know, everything. Nobody there. The Jagannath deities, once a week, a man came on with tennis shoes on and would put some dried fruit or maybe a few nuts. He would sit and chant anyway. This is the abandoned Jagannath temple. There was nothing, it was just a shack. He would chant his japa holding an umbrella when it would rain over the Jagannath deities. He, how did it work? Ah, in the Bhagavad Gita, there was a card that said, send in this card and you get one free book. I think it was coming back or something like that. He filled it out. It was for the BBT, the North American BBT, right across the street. And he thought, well, they're never going to send a book to Burma. But hey, it's free. Why not? And he said, and even if they send it, it's going to get stolen in the mail once it gets to Burma. I'm never going to see it. But hey, why not? So he sent it off. Bhakti Vikash Maharaj, at the time a brahmacharya, was preaching in Thailand. And he wanted to go somewhere else, just to roam around. So he was here, this is 20 years ago, 25 years ago. He's here visiting, and he asked them, hey, do you have any contacts in Vietnam and, you know, but, you know Cambodia, Laos? He wasn't thinking about Burma at all. The devotee said, you know, that's interesting. We just got this card from Burma. 
Because to get into Burma, you have to have a sponsor. You can get in on a tourist visa, but say, you have to stay on the bus. You can't talk to anyone. You can't do anything as far as outreach. But if you have an address, you can get a three-day business visa. Still pretty strict, actually. So he got a three-day business visa. Srivas Pandit, who got the Gita, became a devotee, was thrown out by his father, living in the abandoned Jagannath temple. He met, he comes home to the, the address, his old address, and there is Bhakti Vikash Maharaj, Brahmacharya at the time, sitting in the kitchen, and his grandmother's making him lunch. He had no idea, was he, there's a devotee. And within a few days, Bhakti Vikash Maharaj taught him how to chant japa, taught him how to offer prasadam, taught him everything. And then later on, Bhakti Subdhamana Maharaj, and that's how the whole yatra grew. So I, from raising money, I wish I had a picture of the, I probably should dig it up, of the old temple. But this is the beautiful, it's ready to open. The country now is in the middle of a revolution, a civil war. So you can't get in and they can't, so they're waiting till that sorts itself out and then they'll open it. So next. The problem is you can preach to the Hindu community, but you can't preach you can't do outreach. You can't, I mean, there's so many stories. You have to be extremely careful. So they're preaching to the Hindu community, but they're business people, they're this, the one that, and it's very hard to make devotees. So they've got, we had to tell them stop. We got six temples and a farm donated, and we said, we, we can't staff anymore. We can't take them. Talk about having that problem. That's a far out problem. So they've got to reach out because just like in America, the Indians are our natural friends. They come naturally. They're, you know, probably scratch the skin and there's a devotee underneath, you know. It's just the culture. It's the way it is. But the Hindu population, I think it's 4.4 or 0.5 percent of the U.S. population. Well, what about the other 99.6%? You know, we're supposed to reach out to everyone and we should be pre you know, reaching out to the host. We love the Indians. They built up this society. They're our natural best friends. They make first class devotees. Don't misunderstand me. But what about all the other people? So it's the same kind of thing. You can't out beyond that little pocket. You can't reach out to the population. So there's a super intelligent devotee there. He's a doctor. So to reach out beyond the, human, uh, the Hindu community and how to find leaders, reach out to the university students. So he does these, this is, our, this is Dr. Nayong. That in his name, initiated name, I just blinked for a moment. It'll come back to me in a minute. Oh, jeez, I can't believe it. Super nice devotee. So he puts on these conferences in the universe. What does it say here? Philosophy seminar concerning the what is it, curriculum development. You know, he put you put some nice attractive title. What is it? Theoretic ethics, Hindu ethics. Okay, next. I can't believe I can't remember his name. Huh? Oh, Rashi Shikar, there it is. No, he's a wonderful devotee. So Rashi, single-handedly, you know, you, if you think one man can't make a difference or one person can't make a difference, the old saying is, spend the night, you know, with one mosquito in your room. You know, all night long, you know, you're big by comparison. So he just said, enough of this. How can I, he meditated deeply, how can I get outside this little bubble? to the mass population and get quality people. And he started this program of, you know, rents a hall, you know, gets a university, pays for his own money. So here he is, his presentation, next, because we want to move on, next. This is his, you know, graduate, and about every year, he gets a graduation like this. They've gone all through the Bhagavad Gita. He's taught them how to chant japa. He's taught them how to cook. 
Krishna Prashadam. And if you look at this, if you know the culture, this guy is in the Burmese dress. Uh, she's in a Hindu dress. He's, I mean, they've got this guy, I'm sorry, this guy's Muslim. This guy's Muslim. This guy's Buddhist. So if you look at this, here's Rashik Sarkar and his wife right in the middle. So is it says here, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, they're becoming devotees. The daughter of the minister of education for the whole country, the daughter was in the university, she became a devotee. I mean, that was scary for us, because what to do, you know? She wants to move into the temple as a full-time devotee, and so finally, Srivas, he's passed away, unfortunately, he died of cancer. But he met with the parents, impressed them so much, they made a deal. All right, she can have vegetarian Krishna Prashadam at home, she can wear a sari at home, she can come to the temple, she just can't embarrass us. Strict Buddhist, she can't, you know, be out on Sankirtan in a sari, chanting and dancing. If you, if, if you just keep it on the DL, on the down low, she can do it. And she's in line for initiation. So they've jumped the hump. They're outside the Buddhist bubble. One person determined to do it. Next. So this is Gita Nagari, well known to all of you. Gita Nagari, well, this is from Devamrita Maharaj, who's another innovative, creative person. And, you know, running a farm, devotees like to preach. They like to share Krishna with people in general. It's just a symptom of a devotee. And if you're out on a farm, you know, you can chant Bhagavad Gita to the cows and, you know, but you know, what about the outreach? So devotees get a little dry sometimes, or, you know, a little bored with farm life. And then also, how do you get money to support the place? Farms cost money. So it's a problem. Devam Marjas and the local devotees' transcendental solution. So next. Just for fun, now there should be an arrow here. This is this is Bali Mardan. This is Tamal Krishnamarsh, believe it or not. And they're on Gita Nagri. So the, can you click on that movie? It's right. Archer just said you worked it last night. Of course, we're, here we are again. Where's the sound? No, no, no. We want the sound. Yeah, we're not going to hassle with it. We're going to... And where's Archita? So? Maybe it's me, like the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> I've jammed. Okay, we're just going to, we're going to make it full screen, forget the sound. I'm not going to waste the devotee's time. Okay, we're going to get there. Okay, just skip to the next. That's a bummer. No, skip it. We're moving Shana on. Prabhupada had been standing oh. looking at the wonderful fields. The devotees were gathered around. There were, were two fellows who were new devotees, very enthusiastic. They were country boys from not too far away. And they had brought from their own garden a medium-sized basket full of vegetables. And Srila Prabhupada picked up an eggplant out of the basket and he just held it in his hand as though it were a jewel of some sort and, and he held it kind of up and just looked at it. It had a real value, this produce. You can just tell his pleasure was immense. So at some point he, he spoke about how we should be able to feed the neighboring city temples, supply them with very luscious kinds of fresh foods like this. But not only that, but in time of need, we should be prepared to also produce an abundance sufficient to feed people living in a 10 mile radius. Prabhupada took a walking tour of the barn and the machine area. And um, Parmananda was a little bit apologetic because 
Prabhupada had been to New Taliban a few months ago and chastised them for having farm equipment. But actually they had farm equipment and was standing outside in the weather getting rusty. And at Gita Nagari we had a lot of farm equipment but everything was very well protected. But Parmananda was very much self-conscious. So as he was showing Prabhupada the different equipment, he was saying, and this is a disc and it'll do the work of so many men, and this is a you know, plow and it'll do the work of so many men. And Prabhupada was very silent. But when Prabhupada gave his class later on that evening, he said, it's not that we hate machinery, everything can be used in Krishna's service. He also very much caught our mood that we didn't want to be in the cities. And so when Prabhupada noted that, he commented in his class, it's not that we hate the towns and villages, everything belongs to Krishna. So he saw our mentality and he cut through it very effectively. Thank you, Prabhu. So we can go back to that. So these are the presiding deities, Sri Sri Radha Damodar, who traveled in the famous bus party, and now they've taken up residence at Gita Nagri. Next. So he had the devotees. There's two heroes, and you'll see them in the beginning, who are assisting. Uh, you'll see them at the end. They're assisting Deva Amrita Marsh. They have connected with the local universities, and they do seminars and retreats. You can even go there and get a degree in organic uh, gardening. You know, you stay six months. And so there, there it is. There's one of the group of students that come out for weekend volunteers. Next. This is, and the professor is here too. Somewhere in here. Oh, this guy. This is the professor. This is just one of, this class comes from Penn State. One of the top, you know, schools in America. And they come out and help on the weekends. They come for festivals. And some of them are becoming devotees. So they've made that link between the city preaching and maintaining the farms in a very blissful way. It's taken time to build up. But they're getting groups. Like, I, he told me the number. They get something like 2,000, 3,000 students. Yeah, you don't have to believe me. Archita says it's true. Okay, next. And just in case you're thinking about moving here, hey, I had enough of being out in this, out the, you know, it's too, I'm going to get inaugurated. Well, try the winter route. I put this in for the temple presidents, afraid if I show this, they're going to lose their brahmacharis or their householder couple. Hey, I got to deal with the winter. Okay, next. Now, this, I wanted to, this is Dhruva Prabhu, and this is his better half, and I mean that in every sense. Her name is Parijata. Uh, he was a nuclear engineer, literally. Sometimes, it, you know, it does take a rocket scientist, so sometimes you do need a nuclear engineer. And he designed and oversaw nuclear uh, power plants in South Africa. She was a top executive at FedEx South Africa. They're from South Africa. Had never been a f in a farm in their life. She said she didn't know what, which was the right end of a cow. You know, she'd never been, you know, how, how to milk a cow. What? It comes in a box, you know. But Deva Maharaj was desperate. And he asked them, will you go just for a short time and help stabilize the farm? They're asked by their Guru Maharaj what to do. And they have, they have their own professional dairy now. They're all based on government grants. You can order ahimsa, violent free milk, or cheese. You can get nice, it's expensive, it's the real cost of milk. What you've got now is subsidized, but it's the real cost of milk. But you can order from them online. Then it'll, it'll come in an ice pack, you know, uh, whatever you call it. What do they call that? My brain's not working today, you know. Uh, you know, what do they got? That ice. What do they Dry ice. You can get it in a dry ice package. I recommend it. It'll help support the farm. So, uh, Dhruva was a nuclear engineer. Parijata was an executive at FedEx. They were living peacefully in South Africa. Surrendered to the order of their spiritual master, to the order of Srila Prabhupada. We heard in the beginning there should be farms that can maintain the local temples. 
and they moved. I think that's, is there one more? Let's see, I think that may be it. Okay, here's my point. Prabhupada's driving in Detroit. I've said this before, I'm gonna say it again. <laughs> There's so many Detroit stories. But Prabhupada would take his walk sometimes on Belle Isle, which was out in the Detroit River, which shortly after Prabhupada left, caught on fire, it's so polluted, burned for two weeks. Welcome to Detroit. So uh, the temple, it's a beautiful temple, Deva Sadam Mandir, so many stories about that. But when Prabhupada would drive back to the temple, it's kind of a rough neighborhood. And Prabhupada was driving in his car back to the temple for class, looked out his window and said, ah, oh, this is Mahaprabhu's movement. Govardhan, the temple president, and Jagadish, the GBC, they're looking out the window. There's a hardware store. There's a welfare office. There's a donut shop. Huh? Prashadam distribution with donuts? I mean, they're trying to figure out. You know. so next, year, the next time they come around the corner, Prabhupada, next day, looks out the window and says, ah, this is Mahaprabhu's movement. So that, they, you know, Govardhan, marshaled up his courage, said, Prabhupada, what are you seeing? And what Prabhupada was seeing was the sign on the hardware store. This is for Sherwin-Williams paint. See, it's a paint can, and they're pouring the paint, and it's covering the earth. So this was there, uh, what Prabhupada was seeing. And he was saying, you know, the verse, every town and village, my name will be known. And Mahaprabhu, Prabhupada said, there will be the time that you, you know, you go into a town and they've got a little rock there with a monument that says, you know, this is where the first state assembly met or, you know, whatever it is. Prabhupada said, there will be towns will put up monuments. This is the day the Sankatan party first came and to our town. It'll be historical. So, and I, li I always like this picture here, of course, Gorn and Tai, the way the chart. But if you look back all the way back, there's, that's the length of the Kirtan party. So all around the world, it's actually coming through. Mahaprabhu's prediction, Mahaprabhu's prediction that the holy name and, this, and devotees will be all around the world. And it's happening. So there's just a few samples. Okay, the next, and you know what? We forgot. Um, Bhakti Chad? You have to run and get my, um, that iPad on my desk. And you have to, don't go like a grandmother, go like a, that's almost up there. You got to jack it up. Thanks. So I wanted to share some tidbits from different classes, different experiences in Mayapur at the meeting. And I've got my notes with everything on it, but, well, why not? I'll start off with this one, because it's new to work out. And to confirm the point that we live in a mystical movement, a, my a mystical world, and that Krishna's behind us. They needed to print, this is from Ramaswar, and he shared this at the GBC BBT meeting, you know, Swavas Prabhu is there, the different heads of the different BBT divisions. And we meet with its members of the GBC and we talk about, you know, how to increase book distribution and what, the, what books we need, whatever, you know, whatever issues. And Ramaswar was sharing that they were I think they were printing the run for the Christmas marathon. And I mean, you guys have no, most of you have no idea what it takes. I don't even have a full idea of what it takes, but you've got to order the printing event, you know, in order to keep those books at a price that's easy to, you know, as low as possible, so they can sell as many as possible and keep, still keep them in print, you know, with the money that, from the sale of the book, you print the next wave of books. And they work so hard to get, because, and oh, perfect. No, that's not the lap, the iPad in the, in the black zipper bag, iPad, go like the wind. 
zipper bag, black iPod by the desk. We'll see what he comes back with. Oh, he's a very sincere devotee. I don't mean to harass him. So the, um, you've got to, and Parappa was very strict. He wanted top quality printing. When I first arrived in India, first time, 1973, came out of the Calcutta airport, there was a big billboard and the slogan was, I forget what the product was, best and cheapest. And Prabhupada wanted the best and cheapest. Because, you know, it's, it's, it's Shastra. It should be first class presentation. That requires quality paper. But then Prabhupada wanted the best price so as many people could get them as possible. So just to, you know, you've, you've got to calculate. It's like driving with a gas and a clutch. You got to figure out how to get the quality paper at the best price. You got to find the printer. You can get a long-term contract, but then you got to make sure it delivers on time. I mean, those are just a few samples of what our devotees over here working on the BBT, what they're doing, so that the devotees on Sankirtan can have a first-class book at the lowest price possible, so they can distribute as many as possible, so as many conditioned souls can get the message of Bhagavatam. And remember, it only took one to open up a whole country, Myanmar, thousands of miles away. So <laughs> Rameshwar said they needed $250,000. It was for a large print at the Kingston Press, was the one we used? Port, something, King, whatever it was. Huh? Kingsport. Huh? Yeah, in Tennessee. Huge print. So they got to calculate the whole thing and it, and they, in order to have the, thank you very much, Prabhu. And that was pretty fast, actually. And he's not winded. He must be in good health. The, um, okay. So the, should I save it for later? No, I'll say, because we need to end pretty soon. They needed $250,000 to get the price that they needed to, and they needed to get the books printed in time and they didn't have the money. They'd sent that whatever, I don't know the exact details, but they'd, they'd sent the markup or the layout of the whole thing or maybe they already had it. And the press kept calling and saying, Look, we gotta have 250, if you want those, this many books at this time, you've gotta send $250,000. And they were stalling the press and waiting, and finally they, got, they just didn't have the money. So Ramaswar was the head of the BBT, North American BBT at the time. <sighs> Such a headache, what to do, completely in anxiety. He's over here at the Sunday feast. And he's talking to a nice guy, you know, maybe in his 30s, young guy, 30, 35 nicely dressed and you know he's explaining Krishna consciousness the guy's asking nice questions finishes his knockout plate of prasadam Prabhupada said we are not nonviolent held up a gulab jamun said these are our bullets so you know the guys you know he says you know I'd like to give you something so Ramasva says okay he walks over to his brand new Mercedes pulls out one of those metal bullet, you know, those James Bond, you know, uh, briefcases, gives him this briefcase. Says, thank you very much, you know, yeah, you, maybe you can use this. Gets in the car and drives off. Ramaswar is a Brahmacharya, what am I gonna do with the James Bond briefcase, you know? I mean, what am I gonna do with this thing? Anyway, he gets home, back to his little, you know, wherever he's staying, and he opens the thing up to see what's inside. Stacked bills just like the movie. It's a suitcase full of bills. He goes to Karunda, who was in charge, actually Karunda was in charge and Ramaswar was his assistant. And he says, what do we do? Take it to the bank. <clears throat> they, it was nighttime. First, I mean, they were there when the, the guys opened up the bank, they're knocking on the door, you know. They go in there, they put it through the counter machine two hundred and fifty thousand dollars they immediately sent it to the um 
printer immediately just sent it off you know here's the money get it out don't waste it get it get rid of it get it I don't know whether it was the next day or the and the, and the presses start rolling and the books are coming maybe the next day or the day after three Mercedes pull up but it's a different group of people and they're in a different mood you know, the one guy gets out behind the other two cars, big burly, you know, you had to pour them into their suits, you know, and they're the muscle. Quiet, arms crossed. And the guy says, you know, one of our associates was here on Sunday and he gave you something. We want it back. It's not the kind of people you argue with, you know, if you value... You know, Ramasura is a little barometer. Well, actually, we, you know, we, you know, we, said, we, we don't have it. What do you mean you don't have it? We don't, we don't have it. They told him the whole story. And then, you know, they explained to him, you know, these are books. They're saving the world. They're, you know, this is, you know. And the heavy guy who wanted the money back thinks about it, thinks about it. And Ramasura says, you know, in case you've ever done anything, you know, that might be a bad karma for you. I mean, look at the guy. You know, this will alleviate it. You know, he's tries throwing everything he can at it. And the guy thinks, yeah, I've done a lot of sinful things. Maybe this is my get out of jail card. And he says, uh, all right, you keep it. Gets in the car and drives off. So, I mean, is that mystical or what? I mean, I... I okay, so we'll just buzz through a few. I wonder what to do because it's late. I think so that today's a codice, right? So what we'll do is on Monday we're going to talk about Jayananda because it's Jayananda's appearance day. I'll, we'll do a few of these because these are there's some sweet stuff. I'll give you an example, the kind of things that you find out about. This has nothing to do with uh, Rupa Goswami wrote the. Uh, Lalita Madhava, it's a play actually, and it's about the gopis in Vrindavan feeling separation. It ultimately goes to the gopis meeting Krishna and Dwarka, but not being, you know, it's not the same as Vrindavan. So it, the theme of the thing is all about separation, the gopis feeling separation. He gave it to Raghunathas Thakur, Raghunathas Goswami, to edit for him, because they would share their books. They'd, uh, anyway, so many examples. They, uh, what is it? Gopalbata Goswami edited the Tatsandarbha for Jiva Goswami. So they, you know, you need an editor on your, some, a different set of eyes looking at your work. So he gave it to, Go, uh, to uh, Rupa Goswami, wrote the Lalita Madhava all about separation. And he gave the play, the Lalita Madhava, to Raghunath Goswami to read. Now, Raghunath Goswami is out at uh, Radhakund. And he was feeling the separation. His body was going through all the tears and throwing himself on the ground. And, and uh, the, the local villagers, they were afraid that he was going to leave his body. Every time he opened the book to do the editing work, and he just, his body would become like a storm. You read in Chaitanya Charitamrita what it's like. So what, they were afraid he was going to leave his body. But he was determined because his senior Goswami, Rupa Goswami, had asked him to edit it. So the villagers re went to Vrindavan and reported back to Rupa Goswami. You've got to have him stop reading. He's got to get this out of his head because he's going he's to die in separation. So Rupa Goswami wrote the Danakeli Kumuda, which is all joy. It's about the Danakeli, the tax, you know. And I, I got a little copy of it. Um, and it's, it was designed to be completely humorous. And it's Krishna harassing the gopis and the gopis harassing. And, you know, oh, you say you're the king of, what kind of king are you? You know, you're the son of the king, but actually Radharani's the queen. I mean, they argue back and, and it's completely humorous. So he wrote it in one day, sent it off with the villagers, and said, now forget about editing that book, edit this book. So Raghunath Goswami was cured from dying of the ecstasy of separation by reading the Dhanakeli Kamuda. 
That's a little bit of Goswami flavor in Vrindavan mood. So I wanted to end with some nice, the kind of things that, because you think, oh, the GBC's meeting and the BBT trustees, and they're just bureaucrats administrating, and all they're doing is passing resolutions. No, there's a whole lot of bliss going on and nice pl preaching planning. So we will end there and we'll, do, we'll finish up on Monday. Thank you very much, Prabhu. Sorry, Krishna. And you, and the point I'm trying to drill home because it's true, is you are part of it. Everybody else, no one's going to remember, you know, Bill Gates. Nobody's going to remember what to speak of Clinton or, or tr Trump or, but the Sankatan movement, the Hare Krishna movement that changed the world, that brought in a civilization that actually had dignity and nobility and real happiness. We did it. And you're part of it. So it's something. You're not. People waste the most valuable thing they have, which is their life. It's the most valuable thing we have. We have time and we have our life. Everything else we have no control over. And we're giving that to the Lord Chaitanya Sankatan mission. And it's spreading all over the world. And people are becoming happy. One last thing. I'm sorry. I'll say it quick. <clears throat> the devotees have found an old technology. This is uh, Kalakanta, the Kalakanta, who's the minister for cow protection. They started in Hungary. They're doing in Czechoslovakia. They're doing in London now. There's a way by taking bulls. You know, bulls go around and grind the grain. They can also make electricity, generate electricity. And our farms in Hungary and Czechoslovakia and London are now pulling water from the well, sawing the firewood, lighting the building, heating things, all from electricity produced by bull power. Now the thing is, how are you going to reduce all the, you know, the, the, what is their goal, 2% by, the, by the 2030? You know, uh, reducing carbon because of global, you know, what do they call it? Not, they don't say global climate change. How are they going to do it? They're still burning fossil. What's, what are the alternatives? The EU has sent their minister has, uh, for, you know, whatever it is, climate change. He visited the farm in Czechoslovakia. He visited the farm in, uh, uh, in, in Hungary. A big problem in Africa is burning fuel. You know, burning, you know, wood and this, it, it creates so much pollution. You can produce electricity by bull power. I mean, there's a whole thing. He went to a farm. We are now registering all of our cows. You can register the print of their nose, like a fingerprint. Their nose, it, each one is individual. Because he went to a farm in India, I won't say where. And they did, uh, what do you call that? Uh, my brain isn't working. Uh, census. There were 100 cows, female cows, and only four bulls. Huh? What, the, what does that mean? It means they were selling off the bulls. Yeah, because what are you going to do with a bull? You know, you can't use them. They're not made, you know, one or two, you can get a tour ride for kids. But you can't really, you know, a few are plowing, but nobody. So they were secretly selling the bulls. It's a big problem in Iskand. What, where do you think veal comes from? They, it's just the bulls. Because, they, they, you know, you have half women, half men. Sell off the men. Keep the women for milk. As soon as they don't produce milk, sell them off. So now every cow in Iskand will be fingerprinted and, red, and nose printed and registered so we know all the cows are being protected and where they are and what is the history of every cow. And on the other side of the coin, if we can use bulls on our farms to make electricity, all of a sudden the bull becomes valuable. You want those bulls. So in developing nations around the world, what are they going to do? What about places in South America, places in Africa? Hey, bull power. So those are the kind of things that the, we are changing the world in so many ways. You should be...
People should be lined up to join the Hare Krishna movement. Hare Krishna, thank you. Tomorrow, do you have a presentation for the no, Sunday I, piece? No, Nothing. no, I think it's for the Sunday.